Well, good morning. This is uh, Jim Moore. You're watching Words of Encouragement. This is um, program number 645. You'll have to excuse me, pardon me. Um, I'm working with some new stuff this morning, and it's got me a little bit distracted, a little bit uh, challenged and all that. So if I if I look like I'm a little discombobulated, you'll know why. That's why. So I, what do they say? You can't teach an old dog new tricks. Well, that's not entirely true, but I think old dogs just don't like to be taught new tricks. So at any rate, good to have you here with me this morning again. Words of encouragement, uh, six pro, episode 645, June 19th, I think, today, 2023. We are in Linda and I, sunny Arizona right now. And uh, it is extremely hot over the next week. We're looking at 105 to 107 degree. Yeah, it's hot. It's like surface of the sun hot. So, uh, but we're glad uh, to be here and just glad to um, be enjoying the sun and and uh, helping some people out and all that. So, um, right now, um, it is... Let's see, yesterday was uh, Father's Day, and so just wanted to give a quick shout out. I got my really nice Father's Day mug right here, and I don't know if you can see what it says in it. Maybe I have to show a little closer. It says, we all live downstream. I It took me a little bit to under, uh, understand what that was trying to get to, but I think the idea of that was all of our actions affect other people, and so it's important that we... Uh, remember, no man is an island. We're not uh, all of us just doing our own thing and, and affecting our own selves. So, all right. So let's jump right into this today. Um, we're gonna, and I'm gonna try to stop doing um ah. All right, the um ah game. All right. The title today: three different things. Uh, you need to be buried, right? How many think that's true? You need to be married and you need to be carried and so a lot of this revolves around baptism today I'm pivoting here um, <laughs> you can tell I'm used to doing something a certain way all right um, baptism now some of you that's gonna you say I've already been baptized you're gonna shut off right away I hope you don't because I think um, I'm gonna be able to show you a few things that maybe you you haven't known before a few things maybe you didn't understand or maybe you kind of heard about them being in the scripture but you don't know where they're found or whatever so I'm gonna do my best to show that to you today so starting out with you need to be buried okay remember three things you need to be buried you need to be married you need to be carried these things actually all interconnect so number one you need to be buried there are actually two times in the New Testament where it talks about baptism being symbolic of buried. Now, one of the reasons this is so important is because, well, first of all, Jesus did, and I'm going to get into that in a minute, but, and I don't want to get ahead of myself, but Jesus says when he was going to get baptized, he said, suffer it. John the Baptist said, suffer it, or excuse me, uh, John the Baptist said, I shouldn't be baptizing you you should be baptizing me. And Jesus uttered those words. He said, suffer it or allow it, permit it to be so in order to, and here's the phrase, fulfill all righteousness. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> now, that's important whenever the Lord says you need to do something to, be, to, do, to fulfill righteousness. Okay, so we're talking about the Son of God who was never unrighteous saying, I need to do this in order to fill to the full all acts of righteousness on the earth. So that means if it was really important for Jesus to do, it's super important for you and I to do. So um, again, kind of getting ahead of myself, but I want you to see where it was written about bearing in baptism. So Colossians 2 and 12 and Romans 6, 4, Colossians 2, 12 says that we are buried with him in baptism with Jesus so think about the fact that we are adjoining him we are he lit we're buried with him I love that I love the idea that we are 
we're we're connected with something that he himself did okay so it's like we're fellowshipping with him we're talking with him we're eating breakfast with him we're walking with him with him we're buried with him jesus was buried twice i don't know if you ever thought about that he was buried in baptism and he was buried when he went into the tomb so this matters it, it matters a great deal it matters to him matter it should matter to us all right so uh, Colossians 2.12, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised, so we were raised with him too, through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. All right, so that's the first one. The second one is Romans 6.4. Again, twice in the New Testament, it says this phrase, this exact phrase, buried with him. That, I love that. Uh, Romans 6.4, therefore we are buried with him through baptism into death okay doesn't sound really exciting but it is that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father even so we should walk in newness of life so really the concept isn't so much the being buried the the, the death and the burial although that is you can't have one without the other I don't know if you thought about it but you can't be actually raised from the dead until you're dead anybody out there you cannot be raised from the dead until you're dead. Now, of course, he's talking metaphorically and symbolically about our life and about what we need to do. I've been talking recently about this concept that the Holy Spirit is bringing his church back to some very important and serious basics in our Christian faith. <clears throat> I think sometimes we feel like we've been there, we've done that, we don't really need to go back there again. And yet, that's the opposite of what the scripture teaches us. In the book of Revelation, Jesus said, hey, remember from that place, you know, remember from which, the place from which we were fallen. In other words, look, remember, go back. Remember what it was like when you first came to me. You know, he's talking about leaving our first love and so on. And it talks about strengthening our foundations. It talks about, um, you know, renewing our faith, renewing, making new again, restoring, okay? to store to restore store means to stock like you store up uh, you know fruits and veg vegetables or you stock up your pantry okay in other words things get empty we need to bring them back I believe the Lord is doing this with the church right now he's saying hey let's go back to some fundamentals let us strengthen our foundation because we are living stones built up a holy temple unto the Lord so it is really really important in the eyes of the Lord, yeah, we want to go deep, right? But you can't build upon a foundation that has been shaken, cracked, or in some way forgotten about, okay? Yes, we want to build, going deep or build, going higher, same thing, right? But if you want to build, hot, go higher, let's use that analogy, if you want to build your house of the Lord, higher and higher you got to have a strong foundation when, when they go to build a skyscraper sometimes they make their foundation they go as deep nearly as deep as they go high and so it's really important all right so a lot of people i'm going to say this a lot of people have never been baptized and i believe the reason why is because they think of it as a kind of a yeah 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 whatever i got sprinkled on as a baby so <clears throat> I'm not going to go so far as to say you can't be doused with a hose or sprinkled <laughs> or whatever. I will say this, though. I want to be very clear on the fact that the baptism, biblically, according to the original words that are used for ba baptizo, it does literally mean to immerse. Okay? I don't know about you. I know, you know, cup the hands, splash the water. I get it. I get it. I get it. I get it. Well, what about people that are in prison, blah, blah, blah. I get it, okay? So don't go legalistic. But here's the deal. It is meant to represent something, and that representation is, is death and burial, specifically buried in water. That's why the Apostle Paul, through the Holy Spirit, it was God, not him, said, you're buried. You were buried in bat baptism. The Ethiopian eunuch and Stephen, out in the wilderness, it says that, they went down into the baptismal waters, and when he came out, he was translated away. Wouldn't that be cool? All right. 
So it's God's way of saying, I want to create a picture for you to start you out on your journey in the right way. Now listen. And I'm going to get to it again. I guess I need to read the scripture because I'm already ahead of myself. So let's see what Jesus said. First of all, it, when it comes right down to it, whatever Jesus does, we should do. Period. I mean, it might be a little harder raising the dead and stuff like that, but we should we should at least be moving towards, gravitating towards everything that the Lord did. Everything. Okay? Well, I guess I shouldn't say everything. He's not calling us to be celibate. Okay? He's not, he may not be calling you to do a 40-day fast, but you get what I'm saying. If Jesus, the Son of God, the Righteous One, the Holy One, the One who never sinned, had to be baptized in order to fulfill righteousness, what would happen if he'd have rejected that and said, no, I don't want to be baptized. I don't need to be baptized. I'm already holy. Okay? That's not that important. It's not that big a deal. I know, I know a lot of believers that have said that. If the Lord would have said that, I want to posture, uh, uh, pose, excuse me, pose a question to you. Would that have been sent to him? Could he have continued to be called the sinless son of God if he would not have fulfilled righteousness? If that was necessary in order for him to fulfill all righteousness, which is what he said, what would happen if he had just rejected that? I'm saying I think it's more important. Sometimes we tend to minimize things that God maximizes. So it would be wise to humble ourselves and come back and go, oh my gosh, I need to do this. Now, I want to say real quick, before I read this, there is nothing in the scripture that says you have to be baptized a second time. Let's say you fall away, you backslide, you get lukewarm, whatever. There's nothing that says you have to be baptized again. Okay? And, however, there's nothing that says you can't be. Okay? So it's not a requirement and it's not a prohibition. Okay? So I think the point is where there's nothing really said about that, there's liberty. And I say that mostly to say if you feel like you've drifted away from the Lord to some degree and you want again to come back into baptism, you just want to rededicate your life. You know, the idea is that the old man dies. The old man goes down into a watery grave, okay, and then you come up resurrected. It is a picture of what Jesus did when he died on the cross. He went into his... His, now, their burial was different. We know it wasn't like in the ground. It was usually in a cave, but that's that's not important. The idea is that he's buried, okay? In order, right? In order to rise again. To come up a new creature. Now, the new creature work is both initial, immediate, I believe, and it's, you know, this is, this is these acts are symbolic of something that actually happens in you. So it's both immediate, there's there's a level of sanctification and, and your position right I've gone so on, and it's progressive. It's not either or, it's both and. So don't let people teach you out of the progressive part. We're becoming like Jesus, sanctified more and more like him. That ought to be happening in our life. I mean, if we're not becoming like him, then it's just like a hall pass. You get forgiven and just live however you want to live. That's obviously not true. But it's not also immediate. <clears throat> we come to the Lord and we are just justified, just as if I'd never said virgins. He, he actually uses that symbolism of virginity to represent purity and so on. Seated with Christ in heavenly places, we could go on and on and on and on. All right. When he looks at you, he sees his son. But we're progressing. Baptism symbolizes what is literally happening to you. So the immediate part of this is when you come to the Lord and you hear the knock on the door and he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens to me, you've got to do something. And you open the door to him, what happens? Somebody say, what happens? He comes into you. He literally, literally, come on, Holy Ghost. He literally moves into your body. Now that's not a metaphor. That's not some kind of a symbolic representation. Baptism is the reality of what happens to you at baptism and afterwards is, is, is not symbolic. Okay? It actually does happen. Okay? He, he lives inside of you. He comes into you. He changes you. You might even be filled with the Holy Ghost as the promise is given I'm about to read and speak with other tongues. 
Okay? I speak in tongues. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> All right? So do you get what I'm saying? Death, that's the cross. You come to him, you repent. Burial, resurrection. Now, let's read what Jesus said. This is so important because many Christians have the idea that being saved, and I, I, I don't use air quotes in a, in a negative way, okay? Because that is a biblical phrase that you should never be ashamed to use. Yeah, but if we say these Christianese, I love how we say that, Christianese. You know what? Every single genre has their own language. You talk to a computer science, they don't mind using computerese. You talk to a medical physician, they don't mind using medicalese. As a matter of time, sometimes I get lost, and they sh we do need to sometimes, you know, bring it down a little bit so they understand what we're talking about. But don't don't buy into this idea. There is a specific language for the, in the kingdom. There is a kingdom language. Anyway, so this idea that we are we come to the cross, the blood of Jesus. We're not just getting forgiven. Being saved, all right, are you listen close? I know I'm rambling a little. Being saved is not just being forgiven. That is one single step in what happens to you when you answer the knock on the door. You're not just coming to the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm so sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. Thank you very much. Tears joy would uh, that's all right to do right but that's not the goal okay that's climbing up on the cross thief on the cross you're he's there you're a thief hopefully you're the thief that humbles himself and you say jesus forgive me of my transgressions i know i am a sinner there again <clears throat> kind of New age, not I don't want to say new age, but sort of the philosophy of the day is, hey, don't don't say sinner. My gosh, that's just so negative. Well, Jesus did. So are we better than Jesus? No, no. I am a sinner that has been saved by grace. I'm I'm no longer what I was, right? Okay. So we come to him. We we get up on the cross. We are the thief that's next to him. We say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. What happens after that? The real point of baptism is to illustrate the new man. It's to illustrate. Okay, I want to be really plain in how I say this. All right? I want you to listen closely, really plain. Being saved is not just being forgiven. It is surrendering your entire life. It is saying, I am not my own. I am bought with a price. This is where so many people miss it right here. This is not a... a quick fix. This is not a get uh, a good help, you know, a get help. I'm, I can't think of what I'm trying to say here, but, you know, um, a self-help program. That's what I'm trying to say. It's not a self-help program. You are literally dying to your old life. Do you get that? Jesus, help us to see this. Help Holy Spirit, help us see this. You are dying to your old life. So many people never get to the place where they say, my life is not my own anymore. I'm going to be a servant of Jesus they're afraid of this. They're actually afraid of this. And I think subconsciously, some people don't get baptized because they know what it symbolizes. If it's just some kind of a, a, you know, a requirement that you're going through in order to just, okay, I checked off that box. Jesus said to do it, so I'm going to do it. Now I'm okay. Then you're kind of missing the point. The point is, I am my old man, and this is Bible language too, right? Don't be afraid of it. My old man is dead. My old man got left at the bottom of the baptismal pool, at the bottom of the river, or that ocean wave that I stood in, whatever. When you come up in the creek, you are giving your old life to him. You are giving your old life to him. This is what being saved is. Behold, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. How does that happen? Well, baptism is symbolic of the spiritual work that God does. You are saying, I believe this so much then I'm going to go through this prophetic act is really what it is. And I'm coming and I'm making my confession. You know, brother, sister, upon your confession of Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life and that you have been forgiven of your sins. This is not where you get forgiven. You, this is what you do after you've made your commitment to the Lord. You are saying, I am giving my life. As I go down in that baptismal tank, the old Jim Moore, 
is dead. You need to be buried. Now, even Jesus did this, not because he needed it like we need it, but he needed to do it to tell you you need to do it. Are you getting that? He needed to do it so that you would not have an excuse not to do it. It is so... Now, to fulfill all righteousness, thou, those words that Jesus said, suffer it now. I'm going to read it right now. Jesus... Now, this is Matthew chapter 3, um, the, verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John the Baptist at the Jordan River to be baptized by him. And John tried to stop him and say, I need to be baptized by you and now you're coming to me? Question mark. Are you serious? Okay. That is kind of the point. This should be the response that we have. Are you serious, Jesus? You didn't really need to be baptized. But what else did he say? He says, but I do need to be baptized. Okay. Why? Was John a sinner? No. Okay. Anyway, he said, Jesus answered John, and these are the words he said to him. He said, suffer it in the King James. Suffer means to allow or permit. Permit it now to be so, for thus it is fitting or necessary, King James, for us to fulfill all righteousness. Wait a minute. So let's just hold the presses for a minute. Hold, hold the horses. Without doing this act, the symbolic in the eyes of the Lord is the second step to repentance. The very first thing, and again, I'm trying to say this super plainly because I don't want anyone to get lost in my articulation. The very first thing that Jesus said you must do, and this will bear out in a minute, I'll, if you can handle it, I'll show you that the apostle said the same exact thing. The very first thing Jesus says, okay, that you need to do is repent. And the very next thing you need to do is go get in the water. Why? What's the big deal about getting wet? Well, first of all, we should humble ourselves enough to say, wait a minute. It doesn't matter if I don't think it's a big deal. It doesn't matter if I don't understand why it's a big deal. If Jesus said to do it, it's a big deal. And at that point, it doesn't really matter if I like it, if I understand, I mean, you should seek understanding. You know what I'm saying? I think we've skipped over this as kind of a lesser thing subconsciously, and it really is a big, big deal. Now, it used to be, I remember growing up in the body of Christ, this was a deal. Everybody did it. There was no, and a lot of people still do it. I'm just saying, do we know why? All right. <clears throat> so then John allowed him, and Jesus was baptized, and guess what happened to him? I'm not going to go into all this, but when he came. When Jesus came up out of the water, it says, literally, he came up out of the water. What happened? The Holy Ghost came on him. I may, I wonder why if some people have such a hard time being really filled with, baptized with the Holy Spirit, is because they haven't done this first thing. I think it is a reasonable expectation if we keep the commandment, and, and, tr- and again, I want to be plain, it is a commandment to be baptized. It's not a suggestion. Okay, you ought to... You ought to get off this program and immediately go find someone to baptize you if you haven't been. And again, if you have, if you want to do it again, whatever. Okay. It's a reasonable expectation, in my opinion, that we should expect after being uh, faithful to this act of obedience unto the Lord to receive the Holy Spirit in a new measure. Even the baptism, which is... It's interesting that it's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. Now, that's another whole thing. I know some of you don't like that. Don't believe that. It's okay. Let's skip down to Acts chapter 2. Now, did the <coughs> apostles slash disciples, did they say the same thing that Jesus did? Did they place the same emphasis on this as Jesus did? One of the verses I don't have written down here, again, I've alluded to it, is where Stephen middle of a a revival leaves suddenly because the Holy Spirit told him to goes out in the desert and an Ethiopian eunuch famous man interesting history afterwards but I won't go there reading out of Isaiah 53 Stephen comes up alongside hears him and he begins to expound to him he says do you know who this man is that you're reading about in Isaiah 53 he was wounded for our transgressions he was bruised (laughs) He, I want to do what he says. 
He was wounded. He was bruised for my iniquities. He wore my crown. He took my stripes. I want to do whatever he said to do. Okay? And so he's preaching Jesus to him. And at the end of his message, they come upon a pool of water. And they, the Ethiopian tells his whoever's driving his horses, hold it, stop, stop. And the Ethiopian looks to Paul and he says, is there any reason why I should not be baptized right now? Is there any reason I should not be baptized right now? And he says, if you believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Son of God and that his blood will... Fr-, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the quote. He says, you, can be ba- you should be baptized right now. And it says they went down out of the chariot. They went down into the water. That must have been quite a message that he preached. Okay, how do, the Ethiopian didn't even know about baptism until this little message of Paul. Paul must have included the message of baptism in his preaching to the Ethiopian eunuch, or the very first thing that the Ethiopian would he wouldn't have said that he would have said, "Well, what, what should I do? Should I start going to church? Should I? Should I? What?" The very first thing he said, "What doth hinder me to be baptized?" All right, so let's look at. Um, Acts chapter 2. Now that's one incident. Here's another one. Now this is Acts, you know Acts 2, right? They're all in the upper room. They tarry. They waited upon the Lord. These guys had all been baptized, I assume. And uh, and the Holy Spirit fell on them. Okay, And they went out and it was noised abroad and people came together and they say, what is this? And blah, blah, blah. All right. Verse 37. Peter's talking now. The chiefest of the apostles. Okay. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? I've been baptized, I don't know, four or five times at least. I, I, I'm not, I don't want to initiate the idea that this has to happen or whatever, but I, I've met so many people, they feel like they, you know, like in the book of Revelation, Jesus you know, he, he rebukes, he, he corrects. He says, you've left your first love. I don't think he was like thunderbolts and lightning. He was saying, dude, okay, you know you're not in love with me like you used to be. Okay, what shall we do? Okay, now these were people that weren't believers. I get that. But I think it's the same thing. It's a commitment to the Lord. And if you need to make a recommitment, make it. Lord, this is not just about you blessing my life. This is not just about you delivering me from drugs and alcohol. You know, this is not just about me. I don't want to be, you know, this is about me saying, I'm giving my life to you. I am giving my life away. The old Dave, the old Jim, the old Dean, the old Hannah, the old Linda, the old Debbie. I, I am not that person. I am gone just as final as death is. You know, I, I hear people all the time, you know, I tried Christianity. And I tell them, I said, you know, you don't try death. Death is, that's it. Okay? Unless you're resurrected. Okay? Well, I tried death once. It didn't work for me. <clears throat> we carry our cross. What did Jesus say? He actually used this. this I'm borrowing his terminology. He said, if any man come to me, you have to die to self. Okay? Die to self. Take up your cross, that's an instrument of death, every day, and follow me. The old me is gone. This is why so many people are confused about their relationship with God. They have never crossed that bridge that says, I am no longer the old Danielle. I am no longer the old, you know, Elijah. I am no longer him or her. I am a resurrected. I am a new creature. Maybe you even have a new name. I am different and I am becoming different. I'm different in his eyes and I'm becoming different in my own eyes and in the eyes of the world. That's my old identity is gone. Okay. Salvation is about giving the title deed of your life back to him. All right. So, they cried out and they said, Men and brethren, what must we do to be saved? To be saved. Are you saved? 
listen to the two things. It wasn't one thing. It was two things. Is the natural act of baptism required for salvation? I don't think you can go that far. There are some denominations that do, and and I understand. It's a it's a for me it's a thin line, but I think it is it is right up. I think it is way more important than we have given it credit for. So we said two things to fulfill all righteousness. Two things to get yourself started on the right track. Two things. One is something in your heart, and one is something with your flesh. In your heart you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you make confession to Him, and you say, I'm giving my life away to you. I'll never go back. I am dead. I am dying. And then you walk, then you play it out in the natural. You do a prophetic act to, to show everybody this, I've done this. I've done this in my heart, now I'm doing it on the outward. I want everybody to know about it. I'm not ashamed. You see, there's one thing about Christianity that people need to understand. You cannot be ashamed and be a Christian. Jesus said, if you're ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you. I didn't say those words. You can try to soften it up if you want. I'm afraid to do that. I'm not going to do that. Okay, so what did he tell him? He says, repent, that's the inward, and be baptized. That's the outward. Every one of you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and all those that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now there's a whole message here about being filled with the Holy Spirit, but that's not the message today. <clears throat> the emphasis I want to bring you said this is for everyone. Nobody is exempt from this. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. For the promise is unto every one of you. Every one of you, you, your kids, your grandkids, your great, as many as the Lord will call. I don't know how many more ways he could say everyone. He really wanted, that Holy Spirit really wanted to emphasize, don't pass this up. Don't skip over this. Don't hopscotch over something because in your mind you think it, it probably isn't that big of a deal. Maybe it's a way bigger deal than we've allowed it to be in our heart. So, I'm going to show you one more thing here, about, hopefully just about five more minutes. I want to show you another symbolism about it. <clears throat> so we're talking about repentance and baptism, inward and outward. We're talking about being buried and resurrected. I just love that. Because in a way, Jesus is going, yeah, you did what I did. Yeah, you didn't have to go to the cross and bleed literal blood and, and cry but you did it you did it yay okay but here's another one two becoming one do you I'm going to ask you in all seriousness do you want to become one with the Lord union with Christ is the, our goal you say well I'm already at union with Christ yes and no you yes you are I, I don't want to diminish that okay I don't you don't have to diminish one in order to emphasize and when when the other argument okay you don't want to you want to avoid that it's not either or it's both that when I married my wife and we said I do and the old gym the the bachelor gym that I, I'm gonna do things my way and it's all about me and it, it wasn't a partnership where you get to come in now and I get to tell you what to do are you listening to me that's how we come to the Lord so ah I'm right with God now. Now I can just every day tell you everything I want you to do. <laughs> That's not what a servant does, by the way. You know, a servant doesn't come, you know, kneel down in front of the master and say, okay, here's what I'd like you to do today. <laughs> you know, so it's a good practice when you pray in the morning to start out by what, Lord, here I am, Jesus, I recommit myself. I re re up my commitment to be your love slave. What would you have me to do today? And then later on, start asking about the things you think you need because he did say to do that so when Linda and I came together we started are you listening a process of becoming one let me say it again we started a pro now are, were we married we started a process I got to finish my sentence we started a process of becoming one so well you're not really married no we are we are we used to joke around with some of the kids that we officiate for and we'd call them up after they left and go oh we forgot the we forgot the marriage certificate you're not actually married and they'd freak out and yeah anyway. yep yep we do that <laughs> so when you say I do you are in the eyes of God 
Okay, you're married. It's the same way when you repent, okay, and get baptized. You are now, two are becoming one. It is both initial and a lifetime process. Now, what you say, well, why is that important? Because that is the goal. The goal isn't for you just to get saved, air quotes, okay? The goal is to be, for you to become one with Christ. Did he say this? Oh my gosh, yes, he said it. He said it in such a way that there's, it's like, no wonder Satan hates marriage. It is a type of the, of the union that we are currently, we're supposed to be engaging with and, and saying yes to every day of our lives. Let me read it to you. So, would you be surprised if I told you that this symbolism was articulated by God all the way from the book of Genesis. Many people don't know this. They think it's just a New Testament verse. It's not. They're actually in the New Testament, both Jesus, uh -huh, Jesus, and I think it's the Apostle Paul, yes, quoted what was written in the Old Testament. So let me read Genesis. Adam, so, right, Jesus is the second or the last Adam, excuse me. There's the first Adam and the last Adam over there. Adam said, this is now bone of my bones <clears throat> and flesh of my flesh. This is very specific language given. This is not, I kind of make fun of the phrase, I don't, I don't, I should, I'm not making fun, but I think we like to see this as mostly a spiritual thing. It's our spirits. Two flames unite. You know, we take the candles, we put them together, we pull it, we take two, uh, things of sand. I'm talking about it and marriage ceremonies. Pour them into one thing. It's talking about your flesh. Now why does he say that? Because the flesh is the least likely thing that people would think are coming into union with Christ. Or like a natural man and a woman. Yeah, you don't really become one flesh, do you? No, actually you do. Even science has no legitimate reasonable explanation for why two people live together long enough, they start, are you ready? Looking like each other, sounding like, now some of that could be kind of a natural osmosis, you're with somebody, you hear them talk all the time and so on, but there is definitely something supernatural that happens in the marriage covenant. I believe it was, well, let's just say it was the Holy Spirit says, should I, have you never read the two become one flesh, should I join myself therefore unto a harlot? God forbid. You want to become one flesh with a... So what I'm saying is there's something supernatural that happens that it, in the natural that is symbolic of what happens with Jesus. We are becoming one. Whether you realize it or not, you're becoming like Him. This is why it's called... Are you ready? I'm leaning in. The marriage... Two things married together. Marriage supper of the Lamb. This is why He calls Himself the bridegroom and calls us the bride. It's not about just romance and intimacy. It's about oneness. Do you get that? This is a massive revelation. And the starting place for that is baptism. Okay? We are becoming one with him. All right? So let's read it. Therefore shall a man leave... Oh, excuse me. I was, I was reading, I'm still in Genesis. Um, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Now that phrase is used again in the New Testament. She shall be called woman because she'll be taken out of a man. No wonder the devil hates this. Therefore, here's the, here's the quote, Old Testament. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife and they too shall, or they shall become one flesh. Genesis. Now let's read Jesus. Fast forward, words of Jesus. Let's see what he said in, a couple times. It's, I use, I'm using Mark chapter 10, 6 through 9. But from the beginning, he's talking about divorce, but from the beginning of the creation, that's Genesis, God made them male and female. It's never going to change. All right, I'm not going to go there right now. <clears throat> For this reason, he's going to quote it. Jesus is quoting the word, which is him, so it's him quoting him. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined. Okay, do you realize the word married means joined? It means this thing and this thing become one thing, okay? We do. I like using that illustration of food. I love to cook, okay? And in cooking, you marry one flavor with another, 
until you make a new flavor. <laughs> there you go. Leave his father and mother and join to his wife and the two shall become one. He didn't make a mistake. You shall become one flesh. At the marriage supper, the, let's call it a marriage feast, a marriage celebration. And I want you to really hone in and hear this because this is a huge theological principle. We do not get married at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Pause for effect. When do we get married? The day you kneel down and repent and say, Jesus, come live inside of me. I give my life to you. That is the equivalent of the marriage ceremony. That's when you say yes. And then you're baptized. That's when you're saying yes. So, yes, you are married. But listen close now. The consummation... The fulfillment, let me just say that because consummation could have sexual overtones and I don't mean it that way. The fulfillment, so you spend, are you listening now? Listen close. From the day you say I do to Jesus, your heavenly bridegroom, sorry guys, deal with it, you begin a process that takes your whole life, becoming one with him changing it's not a one-time thing it's a the rest of your life thing the marriage supper of the lamb is the finality of that at least at least it's a, a super powerful shifting because i think actually we're going to become more and more like the lord even once we go into heaven but it is a dramatic conclusion of everything of the years you spent are you listening man i feel the lord right now of the years you've spent saying yes to him yeah, but what about my failures? You know what? He said, I'm not going to leave you. He's never going to take the ring off. Are you understanding? He's never going to take the ring off and go, you fool, you dummy, you idiot, you blew it two minutes. He's never going to do that. He's never going to do that. If you're listening to me and you're one who's failed a thousand times, he's never going to do it. Okay, he knows who you are before he said, I want to marry you. I want to marry you. He's the one. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. He's the one that's been pursuing you your whole life. And hopefully you've been saying yes. And at the end, what you have striven for, and I know people don't like the word strive. I don't care. You know, what you have desired. Because there is a certain amount of, you know, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Yeah, anyway. What you have hungered and thirst for and said yes Jesus and repented for and been broken for and being joyful your whole life from the day you said yes and you crawled up on that cross and was buried in the waters of baptism from the day you said that at that final day when everyone gathers together there's going to be a huge fulfilling at least a large degree fulfilling of that union to becoming one. So Jesus said it, Mark chapter 10, then Paul repeated it. All three of these are Holy Spirit saying it. Okay? I wonder, I'm, I'm not trying to be sarcastic here, I, I wonder if we have really just missed the importance of this. Why is it so important that we see the symbolism? Because it anchors you into what you're called. We have tried so hard to get people just to say yes to stuff, Instead, you know, Jesus didn't do that. He said, hey, dudes, if you want to follow me, you're going to have to die. Wow. What a great evangelistic, con you know, uh, procedure. Tell people they're going to have to die. <laughs> you know? I'm just saying, I think in, in our sincere desire, you know, to make it applicable and, and easy to, and all, we, we sometimes do a disservice. And I think this is one of those things. Anyway, all right. Not trying to be hardcore here, but I am. All right. Ephesians, this is Holy Spirit through Paul. It says, now we are members. I said five minutes. I, I'm not. Yeah. Now, for now, we are members of his body. Same principle. Two becoming one. Members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Where did we hear that? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Well, it said that all the way in Genesis. Adam said it. And then Jesus said it. Now Paul is saying, very specific. It's flesh. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. For this reason... Shall a man, he's quoting it again, all the way from Genesis and the words of Jesus. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be cleave, cleave, the word cleave, those of you who are uh, King, Jamer, King Jamers, <laughs> King Jamers, 
Cleave means two becoming one. That's what it means. Okay? It's like grafting in a tree. You take this branch, you graft it in. It's, it's two becoming one. For this cause shall that man be joined, it says in New King James, or cleave to his wife. The two shall become one. Period. No. Flesh. Again. <clears throat> Can I say this? Your flesh becoming one with Christ is just as important as your spirit becoming one with him. <clears throat> I'm say it again. You can't become one with Christ without your flesh coming along for the ride. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this flesh? You can't become one with Christ without your flesh coming along for the ride. Are you listening to me? There's a there's a gymism, a, ma a, 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 a refrigerator magnet saying, I can't even talk. All right. Trust me, your body does come along for the ride. Your flesh matters. I'm not saying you get saved by good works. It's not one of, you're saved by the blood of Christ. You're saved, seated with Him, positioned. Yes, 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 yes. We hear that all the time. I 100,000 million percent believe it. But we need to hear this part too. Okay? Bone of His bone, flesh of His flesh, His body on this earth. Okay. Last verse, Isaiah chapter 63 this is the carried part. So I said in the beginning, almost done, you need to be buried. Somebody say it with me. You need to be buried. I need to be buried. I need to be married. And here's the last one. I need to be carried. Carried. Huh. Well, now that's, and it rhymes, so it's cool because it rhymes, right? What does it mean to be carried by the Lord? Does it even say that in the Bible? Oh, Son and daughter of God. Yeah, it does. Do you realize the whole footprints in the sand story? I saw two sets of footprints, and then there was only one, and the person said, Lord, in my hardest time you left me. And he says, oh, no, my son, my daughter. In your most hardest time, that's when I carried you. Does it actually say that in the Bible? Have you ever even looked it up? Uh, again, not trying to be Debbie Downer or sarcastic here, but you got to start looking up words. You really do. You need to start Google DuckDuckGo. Well, I don't even know. There's a bunch of them. Look up words. Now, if you don't have a Bible app on your phone, I like to read the physical Bible, but I also like to use, I'm using the phone right now because I kind of have to. Look up the words. Look up. You know, does the Bible say God carries us? You'll be amazed at how many times it does say. He carries you. Now, does that mean He carries you every step of the way? I don't know. But it does say He carries us. Let, let me read what He said. And Again, Old Testament. Old Testament. We have a better covenant. We can believe for greater things. But if So if they had this, okay, I want to prep you. We have, we should be leaning into asking for more. All right. The idea that, that God abandons you. This is Satan talking. God abandons you in your difficult times. That is Satan. That's not the Lord. All right, let me read it. It's in Isaiah 63, 8 through 10. For he, the Lord, that's God. For he said, surely they are my people, children that will not lie. So he was their Old Testament Savior. Did you know that God was called their Savior? Just like we call Jesus Savior in the Old Testament. Good, good to know. goes on. In all their affliction. I believe this is one of the most important verses in the Bible. And it's one that many people don't know. Okay, Because you have affliction. And it says his posture during your affliction. Have you ever wondered God's posture during your affliction? The children of Israel went through crazy affliction crazy hard times. What was God doing? Let's read it. In all their affliction, he's talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness, the, the, excuse me, in all their affliction, he was afflicted. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. Who's he? He's talking about God. Let me say it again. In all their children of Israel's affliction, he felt what they felt. We have not a high priest that cannot feel the, the uh, uh, or, well, I'm not going to be able to quote it. I hate when that happens. Okay. 
We have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tested or tempted like we are yet without sin. We have a compassionate high priest. In all their afflictions, he too was afflicted. And, now that's important, because if Satan can convince you that you have a uncaring, unsensitive, well, I hope you make it, kind of a God, that's the kind of God you're going to meet when you pray, if you pray. Okay? In all their afflictions, he was afflicted. Okay. <clears throat> and the angel of his presence saved them. Listen to this. In his love and in his pity, or his compassion, he redeemed them. And he bore them, says two things, he bore them and carried them all the days of old. Then it goes on to say, but they rebelled. Okay, unfortunately. He carried them. You can expect the Lord is going to carry you when you cannot walk this walk yourself. Many millions have testified to the fact, and I want, I'm here to tell you it's true. No matter what you're going through, no matter how difficult it is, it is probably way less difficult than it would be if he were not carrying you. Okay? So look up. Realize you're becoming one with him. This too will pass. Okay? This thing that you're going through that you feel like will never end and it's killing you and it's ruining you, he's going to use this to become one with him. So, thanks for joining me. Let me just say one more time. You need to be buried. You need to be married and you need to be carried. If you're not buried in baptism, that's the starting pain, place. And you say, I didn't know. You know, that's fine. Go, don't beat yourself up. Just go get baptized. Know why you're doing it. Okay? If you know someone else that has a, a relationship with the Lord, or maybe they go to church, but they're just not really, you know what I'm saying, give them this message. Help them. Help them understand why. The very first thing Jesus tell us to do is getting us started on the right foot of obedience. So much more we could say, but I just want to say thank you for joining us. So um, look forward to seeing you guys tomorrow. It uh, will be justice for America. Thanks for putting up with my uh, kind of awkwardness here. I'm uh, kind of a new, uh, using some new stuff this morning. I hope it looks okay. I hope it sounds okay. Anyway, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Same time, uh, 7 a.m., 9 a.m., and 10 a.m., depending on where you live. God bless you guys. As I always like to say, give yourself permission to have a great day. God bless.